and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. I've been looking forward to meeting today's guest, Shoshana Stewart, who studied astrophysics at Williamstown, Massachusetts, but has dedicated her life to something entirely different. Shoshana is president of Turquoise Mountain, an international NGO which is making a huge difference to people's lives. Their aim? To protect heritage and communities at risk around the world, providing jobs, education, reviving ancient traditions and restoring cultural heritage to give struggling communities a livelihood and renewed sense of pride. Turquoise Mountain was founded 18 years ago by His Majesty King Charles in partnership with the then President of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai, and Shoshana's husband, academic, former politician, and the Rest is Politics co-host, Rory Stewart. The charity's work began with the regeneration of the old city of Kabul, decimated by decades of war and the revival of the ancient Afghan crafts industry. Since then, thousands of artisans have been trained, historic buildings rebuilt and restored, a primary school and health clinic set up and much more. Under Shoshana's lead, the charity has flourished, helping more communities in Afghanistan, as well as in Myanmar in Asia and Saudi Arabia and Jordan in the Middle East. Stunning craft pieces have been displayed in some of the most prestigious places in the world, including the Smithsonian, Buckingham Palace and at the World Economic Forum in Davos. But what makes a massive difference to those surviving in deprived areas is the millions put back into those communities by selling their wares to international markets. Shoshana, thank you so much for inviting me to your home. And I was going to say, I suspect I'm surrounded by some examples of the craftsmanship from the countries that you work in, but I know I am because the first thing you showed me was a stunning rug from Afghanistan. Well, thank you for having me. I love your podcast. I'm very honored to be here. And thank you for coming to my house. Yes, which is a sort of turquoise mountain exhibition space. For those listening, there's a a Afghan lattice wood table that we've got our waters on and a wood mosaic mirror mother of pearl inlaid behind us on the wall. One of the great privileges of running a craft NGO is that you get to decorate your house however you want. And the rug, you designed the rug that you showed me too, didn't you? Yes, one of the other great perks. So anyone can do it. So my husband just turned 50. And so I wanted to get him something from Turquoise Mountain because it's where we met for his birthday. So we commissioned a carpet, but we designed it as a family. So our kids and the two of us put in all of our spirit animals and the spirit animals of our grandparents. So our older son is a wolf and our younger son's a bear and I'm a giraffe and Rory's a monkey. And then there are all sorts of dogs and cats and other random (laughs) symbols in it. But it's such fun. It's, It's a very ancient Harry's design. So it's a very traditional carpet, but with all these symbols in it. It's a lovely thing to have in our dining room. That must have been a wonderful thing to design together. So did you help draw it and then pass it on to the weavers? So luckily, that is how it works, but is not relying on my drawing skills, luckily. Our lead designer for Afghanistan is a woman named Mariam Omar, who is an Afghan British woman, and she leads the design effort. And what happens is that you know, if you, if any of you wanted a carpet, you would say, I want it in this sort of style and Mariam would do what designers do and she would bring it to life. So that's one question is how you bring an idea into drawing, but then how the heck you pixelate it into a carpet is the other point. And this is really about Afghanistan's opportunity in the world in terms of carpet weaving. There are a million weavers in Afghanistan, so it's a massive industry. They don't need to be trained. They're already trained. They learned it from their mothers and their grandmothers. And it's a totally accepted part of the economy under the Taliban and before, even under the Taliban 20 years ago. But it is an industry in decline and it needs to be an industry growing. In the global carpet market, Turkey is no longer hand weaving. India is beginning to develop out of it. So Afghanistan has an amazing opportunity to take that place. But the key to it is exactly in your question, which is how do you make for today's carpet market, not yesterday's. And that is not about red rugs on repeat. It's about bespoke design. Even if you're making a thousand of them for a huge department store, that client wants to choose exactly what they have, exactly the color matched wool, make sure it comes out consistently. And that's done through a graphing software. So essentially you turn a design into a pixelated graph and the weavers have to learn. It's not that hard to learn. So it's only a small upskill. They literally have a graph in front of them and they have the color matched wool and they are not sort of generally making a bird shape. They're making that exact bird shape with amber 25, not amber 24. And then you get the exact thing you ordered. That thing is to the pixel what Mariam drew. When you sit there, Shoshana, like I know you have probably many times and watched the weavers at work, 
Does it simply take your breath away? Yeah, it does. I'm not an artist myself, and it's such fun to watch true masters because they're just, they have such love of what they do and they're so focused. And so watching them is wonderful. And in the case of carpets, I was in Bamiyan late last year. And the way it works is essentially you have a group of women on a loom, call it four people wide, you know, sort of two meters wide. You usually have a head weaver. So I was in one of our weaving centers there and a woman named Sharifa is the lead in that group. So she's managing the wool and making sure that the colors are right and that they're in the right place. But essentially you have four women side by side. They move at a pace. I mean, the hands are just so quick, but they finish one line at a time. So nobody gets ahead. And that's where Sharifa is managing the process. But it's totally magical to watch it. And you see, you look at the back of the carpet because the front of the carpet is all fluffy, for lack of a better word, because you have to cut it once it's woven. So the back of it, you can see the pattern emerging as they go. It's so wonderful. Oh, it sounds amazing. Let's start with what Turquoise Mountain actually means. Yes. So Turquoise Mountain is the name that actually my husband gave the organization when we were created. And it is the name of a capital of a dynasty that was destroyed by Genghis Khan in the 13th century. And the last remaining monument of the dynasty of the Turquoise Mountain, Firuz Ko is the Minaret of Jam, which is this totally incredible spire sitting in the mountains in Gore province in the middle of Afghanistan, which nobody's seen in a very long time except the people in Gore province. So the point of it is it evokes a great civilization lost to history, which is what we exist to prevent. And what inspired the then Prince of Wales and, of course, Rory to start Turquoise Mountain, which I think is 18 years old in March? It, it is exactly right. So what happened is that the president of Afghanistan at the time, President Karzai, was visiting London and he was visiting the then Prince of School of Traditional Arts, which is, and, and the Prince of Wales was showing him around. It's an incredible institution, just such high quality, so rooted in heritage and has a, a very strong Islamic art component. So the president is saying, oh, this is so incredible, but we have these wonderful traditions in my country, but they're disappearing because we've been at war for 30 years. I think most people are like, yes, I'm so sorry. How sad. But of course, the Prince of Wales is like, let's start one. So, <laughs> so Rory, my not then husband, I didn't know him at the time, sort of deployed to Afghanistan to check it out. So he goes because he had a relationship with Afghanistan and the, the prince knew him. He had walked across Afghanistan in the winter of 2001, right after the Taliban had been toppled. So it was essentially no government. He walked across Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and Nepal. But when the Taliban fell, he went back and did the Afghan section. So it's a country he had a relationship with. So he went to see if he could set up a basically an, a school of Afghan arts and architecture. And what he found was an incredible, I mean, I don't think he expected to say yes. I think he expected to come back and say, I'm sorry, sir, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> but actually, he found this incredible neighborhood in the old city called Murad Khani, right on the banks of the Kabul River that had these spectacular courtyard buildings and was just in total state of disrepair. Earth buildings after 30 years of no central government is not a good thing. They just collapse and fall down. And so he thought, okay, we're going to put this art school in the middle of this neighborhood, use it as a centerpiece of regenerating neighborhood, and let's go. When he was walking, was he walking for pleasure? Was he just on an adventure? Yeah. <laughs> many people have asked him this question many times, including myself. There's no, no good answer. What are you doing, Rory? <laughs> what, what are you doing? Because it was like two years. He took sort of temporary leave from the foreign office and set off. I think it was an adventure. I think it was trying to get a, a sense. You know, he was born in Hong Kong, spent his childhood in Malaysia and then school in Britain. So he lived in so many different cultures and I think was beginning to sense the distance between the way that foreign governments and the West view a country and what it might be like, particularly in rural bits of those countries. So combination of an adventure and trying to understand better the places he was is working in and he just set off. It's funny, isn't it, how a chance conversation with then Prince of Wales and dispatching Rory off to Afghanistan has led to thousands and thousands of lives being helped, but also marriage because yeah. you know, it's through Turquoise Mountain that you met. How did a young American teacher with a degree in astrophysics end up moving to Afghanistan back in 2006? Total serendipitous answer. There's no rhyme or reason to it, except that I was teaching. I was an astrophysics major, and it's a subject that I love. I'm a big Star Trek fan. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but I was a middle school teacher, teaching eighth grade, in first in Honduras, then in New York City with Teach for America, and then in Boston. 
And I was tagging along with somebody who was doing research on Afghanistan. So I just said, yeah, let's go on an adventure. I took a year off teaching and just went. So really pretty random. But I arrived and essentially said, I'd love to need a place to stay. <laughs> I'll volunteer if you, you know, if I can have a bed. So I started working for Turquoise Mountain and sort of six months after it started and, and apparently was useful. And so I got a job and then eventually was Rory's deputy. And then when he left to go teach in America, I ended up taking over and then lived there for about five years. And then the rest is history, hey? What are your memories of that first day? What was it like when you turned up? I think it was the old town in Kabul. The old city of Kabul was in pretty extraordinary state of disrepair. I mean, you had families, most of whom were refugees returning now that Afghanistan was no longer under Taliban rule, refugees were returning and people were coming into the city for jobs. It was just a whole mix of every ethnic group in Afghanistan and extremely poor. Families were living in one quarter of the building because the other three quarters had been destroyed. So that was not a place that any of us could have lived. And really, the families were barely able to live there. We were stored this 19th century fort on the outskirts of the city. It's a mud fort. The Palai Nuburja, the Fort of Nine Towers. That was my home for five years till we finished the old city and moved in there. Yeah, I just remember driving up to it and it's a mud castle. So you, you drive up and it's like probably what we would call a triple height wall, mud wall and a massive gate with big wooden doors and sort of metal hooks on them. And there are these two pairs of legs dangling down from the top. And one was shawar kameez, the sort of loose trousers that they wear in Afghanistan and Pakistan in that region. And then the other was like a dark gray suit and black brogues turned out to be Rory, but they were just sitting up there talking about the nuances of mud plastering. That was my first memory. And then, then you open up these doors and you come into this fort and there are peacocks. <laughs> Quite randomly. Yeah. One of the members of the community in Murad Honey in the old city, Rory had been working with them for a while. This is before I arrived, gave him two peacocks as a gift which is a very weird gift because they're completely unmanageable. And like, luckily we had a gardener who knew how to tend peacocks and knew how to cut their feathers so that they couldn't fly over the wall. And then we had lots of pea chicks. So anyway. It was lovely, lovely memories. I was looking up the simple definition of astrophysics because I am right. a bit fascinated by yes, yeah. I love Star Trek, which I didn't realize meant that I maybe could study astrophysics. Absolutely. But the simple definition is a branch of space science that applies the laws of physics and chemistry to seek to understand the universe and our place in it. And I would imagine in a way, Shoshana, in many ways, helping people out of poverty and giving them a sense of meaning and pride is perhaps the finest window one could have into our universe. So in a way, there's a lovely connection. I like that. Do you like that? I like that. In fact, I'm going to use it now whenever anyone asks you what the hell are you doing? You're having so yeah, astrophysics. <laughs> it all comes together. The cosmic universe comes together. How do you describe to people what Turquoise Mountain does? I mean, I gave, I suppose, quite a formal introduction yeah. of what it does good in, in layman's terms. And in a yeah. nutshell, when you go somewhere new, how do you describe it? So essentially, we support artisans and we support artisans where they and their traditions are under threat. And we do it in any way we need to, any way you can think of to ensure that they can thrive, them and their families, and that the traditions make it to the next generation. If you look at, you know, the case of the table in front of you, how do you make sure that that person can thrive and survive and, and keep practicing? Well, you got to sell it. That's the thing we didn't realize in the beginning is that we have to sell things. <laughs> um, so you have to find markets. And these are often export markets if we're talking about very poor and often situations of conflict. But also something I think we underappreciate when we in the rich world work in the less stable and poorer world about what we can depend on and what we can't depend on, right? So it might even be strange to say if you're talking about a family members in difficult straits that you can just get them a job and that'll sort everything out, right? I think we all know life is more complicated than that. It's particularly more complicated than that when security is not functioning, basic services are not functioning. So at which point you get into all the other stuff that we do. So we buy and sell as a nonprofit. We train the next generation. So we have this institute training courses. We do sales and marketing, but we also do primary health and primary education when we need to. We have a clinic in the old city of Kabul that saw 22,000 patients last year. The vast majority are women and girls because it's a maternal child health focus. And, you know, restoring historic buildings is crucial because one's environment matters, but also because 
craft and built heritage are so integrally linked. Actually, this table that we're looking at with this lattice pattern, you call it mashrabiya in Arabic and lattice and jolly in, in Farsi, actually comes from windows. This is what goes above doors. And it's a sort of way of bringing air and lights into the room, but still being private. So it goes high up on the door. So those are all the things that we do. And I think you ended up doing things that you never thought you would do when you arrived in 2006 and you started the restoration on the outskirts of Kabul. I don't suppose at that point, Shoshana, you ever envisaged yourself opening a clinic or a school, but did that just evolve and then you find your way and learn how to do these things because presumably those requirements came out of necessity once you realized how little there was. You got it. That's all it is. And in fact, Rory would say he thought the clinic was a terrible idea. <laughs> because it, yeah, because if you I mean if you don't do health, you're afraid of it. You think, you know, somebody's gonna die on our watch, we're gonna get sued. This is a terrible idea. But we had an individual working for us called Will, and he spoke beautiful Farsi and spent a lot of time with different members of the community. And basically, they had asked for vaccination programs, referrals to the local hospital. And eventually, he was like, really, we need to do something here. Can I do something? And so we said, OK, here's an amount of money. You can start. Have a go. See if it works. So it came out of community members asking for it and then us taking a chance on doing something more significant. And then, you know, fast forward to the new regime. The day after the Taliban took over, so sort of August 17th of two years ago, that transition happened in a course of hours. I mean, they were not the government in the morning. They rolled into the Kabul city limit. The army laid down their weapons and they were the government in the afternoon. And I don't think anybody expected that. I don't even think the Taliban expected that. <laughs> and so there was this calm, but intense fear. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Was everyone going to be murdered? And they went around to all the medical facilities the next day and were like, come on, let's go back to work, serve the people, men and women both. They said that and they said that at our clinic. So everyone's in their homes and our staff down to the incredible bravery of our country director and our staff, because we aren't going to order them to do anything. You know, Shaqib, what do you want to do? And he said, we're going to do it because if you don't open now, you can't sort of open later. It's very suspicious. Why didn't you open then? So he and, and the doctors decided the men came back first and so then the women, they're going to come back in and start working again. So our sort of rebirth in the new regime, both in terms of our legitimacy in, in their eyes or our whatever our deal is in their eyes and the community that we serve was that day one, we were open again. So I, actually, I think that that clinic has been the front line of the basic interaction with people the, the entire time, and particularly the last couple of years. And how do the community react? You go over there when you're working there, when you go and visit, do you get lovely feedback from the families and people that you're helping? Well, Afghanistan's a very particular case because I've been there for 18 years. I was basically a baby adult when I arrived. I mean, when I see my staff, I mean, I've been to quite a lot of their weddings and they know both me and Rory, of course. So it is a wonderful relationship and it's not an easy relationship. Lots of times there are people stuff that they want us to do that we don't have money to do or can't do or whatever else or their priorities, you know. But I think that fundamentally we've now been through 17, 18 years of conflict and now all sorts of different issues. I think it's a very real relationship that I love. And what it actually looks like is I arrive back, I start walking down the bazaar street and it takes me 30 minutes to get down because I have to say hi to Kakazim and Paulo Anasiz and everyone there. I've never been you painting an incredible picture. I've, I've actually talked to a lot of people from Afghanistan because yeah. a lot of a lot of perhaps Uber drivers or taxi drivers of all and I love hearing their stories. But of course, you're doing it against the backdrop of, of conflict and difficulties. You must have extraordinary teams because when you talk yeah. about things like you, know, you set up the Institute for Afghan Arts, it's not like setting that up in London. The challenges yeah. Yeah. and the difficulties and regime changes are real and sometimes carry great risk, I would imagine. Yep. Yep. I think that's right. And the teams are the point. I mean, we, ha we have about 500 staff members and 490 of them are from the countries in which we work and live in the countries in which we work. So this is fundamentally down to Shakib and his team, Wynne and her team in Myanmar and so on. And I also think that I've been very lucky is not the word exactly, but very fortunate that my senior team who have been country directors and creative directors and things are all people who've been in these countries for years and lived. Harry, my CEO, lived in Afghanistan, lived in Myanmar for five years, had most of his kids there. Talia, our creative director, lived in Afghanistan for five years, built the institute with her Afghan counterpart, then handed over and 
She's been doing this for 17 years. So it does have a family feel with all the chaos that goes with that. And how big is the humanitarian crisis still now in Afghanistan? I would imagine there are still yeah. millions of people living in very challenging situations. Yeah, it's very real. And the economy contracted significantly, something like 25%. Did it? So it didn't collapse, but it contracted significantly. If we had a 25% contraction here, we'd been a, we'd be in a, a real state. Part of that is that we stopped quite a lot of the aid to Afghanistan, which was paying for a very large state and a very large everything. So there are not a lot of jobs. The very first winter, basically, it was predicted that 6 million Afghans were going to die of starvation. And because you then need to buy winter fuel. I mean, the Afghan winter is in snow for three months. You can't drive quite a lot of the country because it's under snow. So if you can't buy food in normal times, you can't then buy food and fuel. So the winter is a very dangerous time. But they didn't. And that was the international community stepping in and getting food there. Like, we don't do a lot, right? But we did that one. Right? <laughs> and then since things have stabilized, I mean, it's, a, it's quite a stable situation. The amount committed to Afghanistan is like less than half of what was asked for by the UN and various international organizations. So there simply isn't the humanitarian support to meet the need this year that there was last year. So there are different predictions about how big the famine will be and when it will hit, but it will happen. So that's very difficult. How do you balance that, Shoshana, with famine there? And I think it's very difficult. You are very well traveled. You've lived in extraordinary parts of the world where you've seen firsthand a lot of this going on. But do you deal with it in your head with looking at the good that Turquoise Mountain's doing? Because the famine side of it's absolutely it's rough, heartbreaking. Yeah. You're a mom and, yeah. you know, very empathetic as well. So I'm just wondering how you balance that in your mind, knowing obviously there's going to be a lot of suffering, but is it because you n know that at least yeah. the work of Turquoise Mountain is making a huge difference to so many people? Yeah, I think it's quite a personal thing how you deal with very significant tragedy around you. For whatever reasons, I'm not depressed every day about the world. I think, I think that is partially just the way I'm wired. I do some teaching at the graduate level in international affairs at Yale. And one of the things that I found myself saying to my students a lot is that I think the world is sort of divided up into scale people and sort of small is beautiful, deep impact people. Those are not black and white categories. And I don't mean that it's 50% on either side either. And the world needs all those. But it's super important to know which one you are <laughs> because some people, my father is one of them, a lot of friends are like this, wouldn't be interested in working with a thousand or 10,000 people. It's not changing the world. You want to work with big levers. You want to be able to move $400 billion of the US government's money into maternal child health around the world, right? Now, those are big levers, but usually they're only impacting everyone's life, a, you know, a part of a percentage point. You don't usually know those people, right? And then there's, I, I'm on the other side of the spectrum of, of like, wanting to, yeah, <laughs> yeah, wanting to have a deep long-term impact and know what you're doing. But that's tens of thousands of people at our best. So that's where my head lives. It lives in the micro, not the macro. So I can talk about the stats in the countries in which we live, but I don't feel burdened by the fact that most of the countries in which I work are fundamentally not in an okay state. I don't wake up thinking about that. I wake up thinking about. We have an exhibition on in Doha at the end of the week and like how the carpets are hung because I was just sent a photo of it. Actually, Mariam has curated this incredible exhibition of contemporary carpets. But I think finally, just that over the last three years, since I suppose COVID started, it got real bad real quick. And so the question of what we do in the world and whether it matters has become so much more sharpened the wedgie because, you know, I always loved what we did and I lived in these places doing it. But then COVID hit very quickly after the Burmese military took over Myanmar, the Taliban took over in Afghanistan, and now we work in the Middle East, we work in the Levant, including the West Bank. This is sort of three crises and four with the pandemic. You realize real quick whether what you do works or not, because if it doesn't work, like nobody cares. Nobody's going to talk to you. Nobody's going to give you money to do it. And we found that it did. And I think it's something about, you know, when everything goes wrong, security disappears, food disappears, everything disappears. You need to be able to feed your family. That's fundamental, right? Which is why the economic bit needs to work. You have to be able to sell. But if you can do that, there is something special and powerful about making. Because actually, when everything's going wrong around you, the, the sort of therapy of making, connecting to your inheritance, something that it's about an asset that you have and that your culture has rather than all the deficiencies around you is special and unique. There's nothing else like it. 
That's such a lovely way to describe it. And on that note, thinking about other things that are made like jewellery and gold and all sorts of other crafts, will you take me 3,000 kilometres to Myanmar? It's a country, honestly, I shouldn't say the Shoshana, but it's a country I only know because I've just been watching Jack Ryan back to back. (laughs) (laughs) And and I feel below with my three A-levels from a comprehensive school in Grimsby, your education of qualifications put mine to absolute shame. So I probably shouldn't mention Jack Ryan and Myanmar in the same breath, but I've done it now. No, <laughs> roll on Jack Ryan, Myanmar. <laughs> Take me there. I don't know what I was in Myanmar. <laughs> no, but I also think that like, I remember saying this to my students yesterday. Nobody knows anything. The world's a big place and our brains are small and we don't even access all the bits of it that we have, right? Nobody knows anything. Even when they know it, they then forget it. So I think like a little bit of humility from all of us about our kind of ability to understand these places. And the more you know, the more you realize you don't know is always true. So my experience in in Myanmar, I was there about a month ago. And it's not an easy story. It's a place where the Burmese military, it's an incredibly brutal regime that just took over and put on Sun Suu Kyi in jail. And it came as a complete shock, basically. All of our young Myanmar staff I think we're in a state of depression for a long time. COVID was really brutal in Myanmar, both in the ways that it always is, but also because everyone was very isolated and really stayed at home and really did not leave. But they, I think, sort of reflected, we thought that this was the world of our parents, where you get taken in the night and put in jail and never hear from them again. We thought this was their Myanmar and we had a different future and then it was just taken away. So that's very brutal and it stands. It's a place in outright conflict. I mean, a majority of the states in Myanmar are in, in outright warfare where the armed ethnic groups are waging an insurgency to try to overthrow the military. The military with an air force destroys villages. I mean, it's just an insanely nasty situation, which is not broadly broadcast. People don't know very much about it. So I arrive in Myanmar late at night. That's when the plane lands and drive through the streets. Looks like it did last time I was there. And, you know, there are a lot of kind of bright lights. They love using neon lights on fence posts and things. And I went into our showroom. We restored a beautiful teak building in Yangon as our sort of atelier. And it's just like walking into a rainbow because it's these handwoven fabrics from all over the country just covering the walls. So these very, very beautiful textile traditions and jewelry and lacquerware, actually there's some behind you, but you have this black lacquer with all these very whimsical flowers and little creatures etched into them. So really beautiful traditions. And I think a similar story to Afghan weaving, which is that there are hundreds of thousands of weavers, almost all women across Myanmar and mostly in the ethnic minority areas. So we work with about a thousand weavers in Rakhine, Chin, Kachin, Karen, Kaya, Yangon states. And a lot of them do frame weaving, but weaving, but a lot of them do backstrap weaving, where you basically you can carry the thing with you. So you hold the yarn against your back and it then comes together in the center. And you put your feet against the wall. I'm not describing it very well. No, you are. Oh, not. <laughs> you are. Mind you, I've got the visuals. Okay, okay you got the visuals. You got it, which is great. <laughs> um, and so when their villages are destroyed, they pick up their backstrap le- loom and leave. I went to essentially an IDP camp, but I think camp is a strong word for it. It's not run by the UN. It's like a bit of land where people have built some shelter. This is a camp about an hour north of Yangon, Legu, where people have predominantly come from Rakhine. And it's our major production center. These are all women who brought their looms with them. And we're now, and you know, you walk in and May and Sue Bash, our textile leads, are just sitting there talking color with everybody, you know, and like tightness of stitch. And that's what the interaction is. They're the only breadwinners in their communities, only breadwinners in their families. And that's what their day is. It's an incredibly hard job. Weaving is a hard, hard labor. But they're talking about color and they're talking about beauty. And then they're getting pictures of these things. You know, we just opened a suite at the Connaught. I saw that. Very new art for those years. Yeah. yeah. It's called the King Suite, isn't it? It is. And yeah. just a showcase, really, of beautiful craftsmanship, presumably from all your projects. Exactly. And Myanmar textiles are in those. So we love sending the pictures to the weavers this week. It's a suite that brings together Syrian, Afghan, Myanmar artisans, as well as Indian and British artisans. And incredible large scale Syrian woodwork. It's a Mughal love story is the theme of the suite. So you walk in and it's like, I was there with a group of journalists covering it last week and one said, it's like Narnia. You just step (laughs) in from the hallway and you're like in this Mughal paradise. 
So very beautiful woodwork from our Syrian masters, Abu Nidal and Maher and a couple of others. And then miniature paintings from Afghanistan, carpets from Afghanistan, and textiles from Myanmar. So these are really all artisans living often not where they were born, having left and in very difficult situations, bringing together this unbelievably beautiful thing. All of the things in your home are unbelievably beautiful. I looked at the pictures of the Connaught and you look at this magnificent craftsmanship, jewelry and furniture and all sorts of things. But then, of course, you had to sell it around the world. And I think there were some key designers really helped out in the early days and have helped you make such a big difference to getting these gorgeous things to market. Totally. Like anything, there's so much luck and personality and and everything else to it. And two things, and they're both British designers. Guy Oliver, who is an interior designer who has done Connaught and Claridge's and others and said, okay, we're going to do an Afghan suite in 2008. Can I tell you how not ready for that we were in 2008? (laughs) And so, you know, Guy came out to Afghanistan a lot and just made us ready and designed it based on the strengths of the Afghan woodworking masters that we had. So we put that suite in 2008. It astounds me at this moment that we even pulled that off. And now 15 years later, this is the second suite. And then a woman named Pippa Small, who is an amazing jeweler designer. And I'm wearing a set of her earrings now, which is this rainbow of five drops of Afghan stones, amethysts and chrysocolla and tourmaline and all of these different colors. She's an anthropologist and she comes to Afghanistan twice a year. She was there like a month ago, Myanmar, Jordan, lots of different places. And she has formed a relationship with artisans over many years, particular artisans who she's mentored to become designers as well. But fundamentally, she just places an order. That woman has bought millions of dollars worth of Afghan jewelry and those other places. So she provides an absolute clear, immediate route to market. And then she has this wonderful ability to tell stories. And she has a very personal relationship with those individuals. She's one of those people where if you look at her, sort of her brand and her website as an ethical jeweler and a storyteller, you kind of go, I wonder if it's as good as it seems, right? And in many cases, it's not. And with her, it's it's better than it seems. She's so humble and quiet about it. And she's unbelievable. She's also six foot tall with crazy curly hair. So I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate being on, you know, in the same room. And Kate Spade as well got involved very early yeah. on, I think, which must have been a great name for you to have, particularly as you're originally New Yorker. So true. That's so true. A wonderful woman named Sydney who worked for Kate Spade just really wanted to take a chance on Afghan jewelry. And so brought these beautiful stud earrings to Kate Spade. And that was a huge deal. And like you said, the name really matters. The other name that really matters is Asprey, obviously a high-end British brand. And they have been buying stone boxes from Afghanistan, these amazing lapis lazuli boxes, nephrite, which is a deep green pink onyx and this like funky cloud yellow onyx thing. And they were doing it for probably two, three years before the Taliban took over. And, you know, you really figure out what a business is about when the Taliban takes over the country. <laughs> Not many stayed and they did. Actually, the artisan who did those boxes left the country. So they've been like, we're ready. We're ready to buy. And we're like trying to get good enough again. The samples just went in last week. So we're going to be ready to restock them. And they're working with us in Jordan on this wood mosaic boxes and in Myanmar and textiles. So And, you know, if I walk into somebody and say that we've worked not into somebody, into a brand or a hotel and say we work with the Connaught, we work with Asprey, we work with Kate Spade, Pippa Small, then they take us seriously because they know we can source with that kind of company. It's nice to see that King Charles and Queen Camilla still take a great interest. I saw some lovely footage of them in Jordan visiting a site that you worked hard to restore. Tell me where they were. They came to Jordan And it was a wonderful chance because he had been to Afghanistan in 2009 and met so many of our staff members. But since then, he hadn't been able to be in the other countries in which we were. And so to be able to show him in person was extraordinary. So we were up at Um Umkais, which is a Roman and Ottoman site up on the northern border of Jordan. It's the most extraordinary place because sort of crossroads in the Middle East. I mean, you look out and you see the Golan Heights, Syria's to your right. Sea of Galilee, it's just down in the valley, Lebanon over the mountains, Jerusalem over your left shoulder. I mean, you are at the crossroads of this place, but they're not passable borders. So it's completely peaceful and there's something going on. So it's a really spectacular place. And we've done a little work restoring some buildings there. And then he met all these artisans, Syrian, Jordanian, Palestinian, we work with in Jordan. And then actually he put on a humanitarian reception a couple months ago and we were exhibiting a lot of the pieces that we make. And then 
try to bring as many artisans as we can. Now, so many of them are refugees in the country that they live, so it's not easy to get visas. But actually, Motaz, who's an extraordinary mother pearl inlay artisan who made the mirror behind us, he came over and along with Siba, who runs all of our sales in Jordan. And the two of them got to meet him again, but here and walked around the V&A. So. Oh, that's such a nice thing to do. And you went to the coronation, which is, that must have been a very incredible yeah, yeah, experience. It was, was it wonderful? Obviously, knowing then Prince of Wales and working with him on the charity he founded, was it quite emotional being there and yeah. watching such an incredible piece of history unfold, I suppose? It was. And the music was unbelievable. And you know, it was wonderful to watch. And I think even more so since... For those of us who have worked slightly more closely with him, it is obvious that he just minds about what he does. And every tour I've been on where I join him in a foreign country in which we work, at the end of the day, everyone he's met is like, how does he keep going? Because he's been doing events from like 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., been served meals five times and on his feet. And every conversation, he's deeply curious about the person he's talking to and he has ideas and whatever else. How does he keep going? That is being seen so much more now and it's so wonderful and all the things that he's dedicated his life to in a very personal way of from climate to heritage. He was way ahead of his time and I think people see that. You said on your TED talk, which I know was a long time ago, you said that Turquoise Mountain changed your life and I would imagine fast forward another decade and it's really changed your <laughs> life. How has it changed your life? Well, I mean, it's pretty hard to say because it kind of is my life. I mean, <laughs> I live in London. I wouldn't live in London. I wouldn't be married to Rory. I wouldn't do the thing that I've spent most of my life doing or not for Turquoise Mountain, but it genuinely is my life. I don't know how else to say it, but I do think that it showed me what I wanted to do in the world, which is a very lucky thing. Not everybody knows what they want to do. You know what you're doing and you have a strong sort of personal sense of it. But I think that's rare and we're lucky to love the things that we do. But also, like, my job is very weird. You know, being a manager, I'm just not a technical professional, being a manager of a project in Afghanistan. I was sort of 26. When I took over, I was a 20-year-old American woman. Learning that I like managing across weird cultural barriers and dealing with the chaos of non-functioning governments. And I enjoy that atmosphere. So I would never have picked that as my career because I didn't know anything about it. So I love my job. I love the funny thing I do. And I wouldn't have found that. The lessons as well, I've heard you say, don't fit into the usual management series. This has been a very organic learning curve, yes. isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, what's that been like? It started off, I think, with you clearing garbage and mud yeah. and presumably taking some risks. Yes, I think risk is part of it. I think strategic planning is part of it, not in the way that one thinks, which is that there is an order of operations to doing projects. I think this is true in the private and in the public sector. You have a scoping phase and you set out your strategic plan and your KPIs, et cetera. It takes quite a lot of money to do all that before you've done absolutely anything functional or useful, right? And basically that's exacerbated in, you know, Afghanistan circa 2006, when basically there's money everywhere and basically a lot of bad stuff is being built and non-functioning concrete buildings and things. So and the Afghan population is beginning to go, a lot of empty promises here. What's going on, right? So the only thing that mattered was delivery. Only thing that mattered, which is why the first thing we did was basically in this old city neighborhood, if you take an earth building and you have standing snow against its foundations for 30 years, it just collapses and it collapses into a house sized pile of earth. So that just brought the street level up by six feet. So you had basically earth, old houses with some plastic bags in there and some trash. So we just cleared it. So we employed everybody in the neighborhood, literally every man in the neighborhood. And that wasn't enough. We had to get more people to just clear garbage. And so everyone was employed very quickly. And then we figured out who we wanted to hire for a more skilled job or a management job. And then we began restoring the buildings. But there was zero strategic planning in there. So I think the first thing is like tangible. You got to show what you're doing very quickly. And usually that cannot wait for strategic planning. You have to think about what you're doing strategically and you have to know what, how you're going to hold yourself accountable. You have to know that this matters and this matters and this matters and this doesn't matter about quality and how you check on things. But that's not the same as having it done perfectly in a grid before you start. And I think risk is a big one, a difficult one. The private sector just prices risk. You just have to pay more money to borrow if you're a riskier project, right? 
But international development doesn't do that. It sort of says you need to mitigate risk to zero, which is laughable in these situations in which I work. So you literally just write a large document that says, here's my risk register. Here's how I'm going to mitigate everything to zero or say it's manageable. And there are these things called pilot projects where theoretically you can test out something, but you're not allowed to fail in a pilot project, right? So risk doesn't really work in this industry. So long as you're doing things in a responsible manner, you can take a risk on a project and it doesn't work and you don't repeat it, but you can do that with private philanthropic money. And it's one of the really important parts about private giving actually is that flexibility that it gives. It's wonderful to hear how it's grown. I suppose one thing, just as I wind up, I was curious as to what drew you to study astrophysics in the first place. And I'm sort of realizing I haven't asked anything about your childhood oh. family or anything like that. But where did that come from? It, Star Trek. Did it really Star Trek, Star, Star Trek, Trek Jean Picard, Star Trek. Well, I always liked math and science. I always just loved science and I loved physics in my sort of final years of high school. And the university that I went to, Williams College, it's a very old American university and very much in the tradition of liberal arts. So it's not a very occupational education. There's no business major. There's no medical major. You can be pre-med, but the point is to get a well-rounded education. So I was an astrophysics major, but that just meant I take slightly more credits in astrophysics. I also took art history and I took a lot of different stuff. Truth be told, I think I majored in rowing. <laughs> that was what I spent most of my time doing. But that is not a discount. I loved physics. And we also had this phenomenal chair of the department who very recently passed away this past year. It was this kind of legend called Jay Pasikoff, sort of one of the world's leading experts on solar eclipses. And so I think part of the reason I chose that major is that every second year, all the juniors and seniors would have to go with Jay Pasikoff to study the eclipse wherever totality was. So somewhere between my second to last and final year in university, we went to Zambia and parked ourselves on the roof of the Intercontinental Hotel to do temperature experiments on the sun. Nice. nice. And it's the first time I'd ever been abroad. I had to get a passport for that trip. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. I think then I would have been probably tempted to do astrophysics too. Yeah. But I would imagine there's never a dull moment Shoshana with Rory. I love his podcast and Alistair Campbell's an old friend from oh, Scotland. Oh, yeah. Days when I was broadcasting. Yeah. But thank you, Rory, for the olive tree that I've been sitting under in your living room, which is rather large, which has <laughs> just recently arrived, hasn't it? From someone yeah. selling on a street. Exactly. Rory is a very wonderful person to live with. And this is the most recent iteration, which is that a few weeks ago, he texted me, do you want an olive tree? <laughs> I sort of wrote back, yes, exclamation point, question mark. Why are you trying to get an olive tree? Turns out there was somebody selling olive trees on Walton Street. So he got one. And I walked upstairs into the living room, which we are now sitting in. And there's this beautiful olive tree. And for me, I love it both because it feels like you're living in a jungle, but also because we just spent the last two years in Jordan and surrounded by olive trees. And I feel like we're taking a bit of that oh, home with us. Oh, amazing. Was life in Jordan good? Did you enjoy it? It's wonderful. Yeah. It's just such a fabulous country. So gracious. Great for our kids. A wonderful place to live with the family. God, what adventures those young children are having. Yeah. Is, is They're not... very proficient camel riders. Are they really? Yeah. <laughs> you don't mount them like a horse. They're down and then they keep their front legs down on their elbows and their back. And, and so you get on them. Then they stand up first from their rear end and then they stand up on their front. And so the whole thing's a massive roller coaster. So the kids now delight in doing it themselves because you, I mean, you really can almost fall off because the whole thing goes like that and then tips in the other direction. So anyway, they can get on and off by themselves. And can you ride a camel? Are you fairly proficient? I, I'm about their level. Excellent. Rory actually can ride a camel can long distances in the desert. Really? Man yeah. of hidden talents, hey? Yeah. Well, talents that aren't hidden, but some hidden talents. I bet not many people knew that. No, no. Right. As you know, I really didn't think we'd end podcast talking about camels. Camels, no. But it's been an absolute pleasure. You're doing some incredible stuff, Shoshana, and your descriptions have just brought Turquoise Mountain and, and your life, because you clearly do live and breathe Turquoise Mountain as well as raising your lovely children. So thank you for thank having you. me in your wonderful home. Thank you for being curious about it. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You've been listening to Shoshana Stewart, president of Turquoise Mountain, talking about the international NGO's extraordinary work helping communities and heritage around the world and how these experiences have changed her life too in perhaps some unexpected ways. Download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week with 28-year-old historian Alice Lock who brings fascinating bite-sized historical gems to life to her 2 million social media followers. So join me then. 